thank you, Jens, um, and thank you for your for, for organising this. Yeah. It's really a great opportunity to be together. Are the speakers are the speakers on? Yeah. Or is it? Yeah. You can all hear perfectly fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I spend most of my time in the first, second, third century. Occasionally, I come into the twentieth century. I started off there many, many years ago doing philosophy, but then I regressed backwards to the second century. I managed to make it to about the 6th century, but then started working backwards again. Um, my wife thought I was becoming up to date by the time I got to the 6th, 7th century. But seeing as she works in a Gothic novel, it's all really relative. Um, so the question really is, what, what can people from the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century say to us today about questions regarding uh, post-humanism and transhumanism? And I would argue, actually, a surprising amount. For they, too, are concerned with what is it to be a human being. And interestingly, it is always what is it to be a human being, not what is it to be a person. It's a very different language. And they're doing so in a very different context. So perhaps, in fact, they alone can challenge our own unseen presuppositions within which we automatically think. So what I'm going to do today is to speak directly from these sources, directly both theologically and unapologetically, speaking in their language, but although it's in a very different idiom than the two talks you've heard this morning, there are, of course, many, many points of contact, and we'll see them as we go through what I want to present to you. I have a sheet here. I always, um, always have the motto in mind that if I give a sheet out rather than putting something on the board, at least you have something to take home with you. Yeah? And it gives you something to write notes on and so on. Okay. So one of the burning issues for us today, and perhaps even the defining issue for our era, is what is it to be human? And also, although we haven't had that just today, what is it to be a sexed and sexual human being? How does being sexed and sexual relate to our common humanity? And then again, in this, what is the role of death? What is the place of death in all of this? Now, the relationship between these two poles, being sexed or sexual, on the one hand, and being human, is also inscribed within Scripture in a manner that seems to set the two opposed to each other, at odds with each other. For while in the opening verses of Genesis, it affirms that God created a human being in his image, male and female, he created them. At the end of scripture, the apostle asserts that in Christ, not only is there neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, but also there's neither male and female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So the two ends of the ark that run from Adam to Christ from being in Adam, to use a biblical language, to being in Christ, define the movement of our existence from the moment that we enter into the world to being born into life in Christ. And as such, they really form the framework within which theology seeks to understand both what it is to be human and the role that sexuality and, as we'll see, death play within this. Now, we often theologize with already formed categories, what it is to be human, what it is to be God, human nature, divine nature. And then we seek to bring them together in the incarnation, to understand how in Christ, divinity and humanity have become one, so that as God become man, we also might become gods, as the saying goes. It seems to me, however, that the thrust of the conciliar definitions and the theological reflection that accompanies it uh, work the other way round. That the one Lord Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen one as proclaimed by the apostles in accordance with scripture, scripture unveiled, this one in fact defines for us what it is to be God and what it is to be human, together and simultaneously without confusion, change, division, or separation, in one prosopon, one face, and one hypostasis, one concrete being. 
He alone is fully divine and fully human. The uh, teleos theos, teleos anthropos, perfect God, perfect man, in one. He shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being, voluntarily laying down his life as one over whom death has got no claim, so that it's by his death that he tramples down death by death, giving life to those in the tomb. He shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being. It is therefore the one Lord Jesus Christ that we must look at to understand not only what it is to be God, but also what it is to be human. So, on the quotation sheet, I have a, the second quotation there is from Nicholas Cabasilas, writing at the end of the 14th century, the very end of the Byzantine era, showing that this perspective is one that held for the first millennium or more. So he says, it was for the new human being that human nature was created at the beginning. For him, mind and desire were prepared. It was not the old Adam who was a model for the new, but the new Adam for the old. Because of its nature, the old Adam might be considered to be the archetype to those who see him first. But for him who has everything before his eyes, the older is an imitation of the second. To sum it up, the Savior first and alone show to us the true human being, who is perfect on account of both character, life, and in all other respects. So Christ is the first true human being. He is, as the Apostle Paul puts it, the image of the invisible God, in whose image we were created. So that Adam and ourselves, as we've come into the world in Adam, Adam, as Paul says, is but a type of the one to come, a preliminary sketch, a model, a starting point from which we are called to grow into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, one of the most striking examples bearing witness to this and what it actually involves is Ignatius of Antioch. At the beginning of the second century, he's on his way to Rome to be martyred in Rome, and he writes a letter to the Christians in Rome urging them not to impede his coming martyrdom. So look what he says. It's the next quotation on the sheet. He says... Birth pangs are upon me. Allow me, my brethren, hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. Grant me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I will be a human being. Allow me to follow the example of the passion of my God. So our usual understanding of the fundamental categories of life and death and being human are emphatically reversed. Ignatius says, I'm not yet born, birth pangs are upon me. I'm not yet living, and I'm not yet human. Only in martyrdom, in imitation of Christ, will he be born into life as a human being. Now in this light, we could spend a lot of time reflecting on what's involved in that, uh, but I want to go further than that. In this light, we can see a new dimension in the opening verses of Scripture, going back to the poem in the beginning of Genesis 1. Having spoken everything into existence, let there be, let there be, let there be, it is, it's good, it's done, everything's good, end of the day, God then announces his own particular project. Let us make a human being in our image after our likeness. And what is interesting when we turn back to it now in the light of Ignatius, is that God does not speak his project into existence with an imperative, like he does everything else, but rather he uses a subjunctive. Let us make a human being. His particular purpose, the only thing about which he deliberates, is a project initiated by God but completed by Christ going to the cross voluntarily, as seen and shown in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, of course, deliberately alludes to Genesis with its opening words, in the beginning, in the beginning. John's playing off Genesis in all of this. When Christ is on the cross, only in the Gospel of John, he says, it's finished. 
is completed to Teleste. It's brought to perfection. And Pontius Pilate, a few verses before that, says, behold the human being, idu or anthropos, eke homo. So scripture opens up with God setting the stage, let it be, let it be, let it be, the world's made, announcing his project, let us make a human being, and then scripture concludes with teteliste, it's finished, it's brought to perfection, here alone, finally, for the first time, is a human being. And so it's by giving his own fiat, let it be, that Ignatius, in turn, following Christ, sees his martyrdom as a birth into life as a human being. So if, as I said earlier, that Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way he dies as a human being, simultaneously he also shows us what it is to be human. In the same way, one cross upon one hypostasis. Moreover, and even more strikingly, for the only work that is said to be God's own work in Genesis, let us make a human being in our image, we are the ones who've got to say, let it be. For the only thing said to be God's work, we are the ones who have to say, let it be. And so you could actually say that the let us make is actually addressed indeed to us. Now, that's a very different way of understanding the work of God than we often do, than we habitually assume. Theology today is much, much more likely to think in terms of God's creative work as having been completed at the beginning. Creation is about protology. An initial perfection from which we then fell requiring God to respond by sending his son to restore fallen humanity. So much is that the case, that from medieval times we regularly ask the question, would Christ have become incarnate had we not fallen? Put crudely, we tend to think in terms of a plan A, which we messed up, followed by a plan B. But equally bluntly, Christ is not plan B. From the beginning of the proclamation of the gospel, as I mentioned earlier, Adam is always seen as a type of the one to come. There never was a moment when there was not a type of the one to come. He's the initial sketch of the fullness that is manifest and realized in Christ alone for the first time. Now, it should be recognized, of course, that we use the word human being in many, many different ways. We speak of a newborn baby as a human being. But if by a human being we mean, as we often do, someone who can walk and talk, well, the newborn baby cannot yet do that. That's not because of any imperfection, but simply because the, limb, the, the tongue and the limbs need to be exercised. They need to be exercised, these organs need to be exercised, a development which includes, moreover, occasions of falling down, getting bruised, misspeaking. And then if we define what it is to be human by what Christ shows us, in the love he displays by laying down his life, then it requires more than simple physical growth to become human. It requires an ascesis of learning virtue to become human, culminating in our actual death, which is, in fact, the one thing that we all have in common. And I'll speak about that a little bit later. The apostle also puts the contrast between Paul, uh, Adam and Christ, not only in terms of sketch and perfection, but also in terms of breath and spirit in Corinthians 15. So the next quotation on your sheet from Irenaeus um, builds upon that parallel between Adam and Christ, sketch fulfillment, breath of life, and the spirit of God, the life-giving spirit. Putting it all together in what is almost all of that one sentence, but highly coordinated. That's why I put the bold and underlined in it. So he says, just as at the beginning of our formation in Adam, 
the breath of life from God, having been united to the handiwork, animated the human being and showed him to be a rational being. So also at the end, the word of the Father and the Spirit of God, having become united with the ancient substance of the formation of Adam, rendered the human being living. Only at the end we become living and perfect, bearing the perfect Father. In order that, just as in the animated we all die, so also in the spiritual we may all be vivified. For never at any time did Adam escape the hands of God to whom the Father speaking said, let us make the human being in our image after our likeness. And for this reason, at the end, not by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by the good pleasure of the Father, his hands perfected a living human being in order that Adam might become in the image and likeness of God. It's an eschatological reality, not a protological reality. It's at the end, not at the beginning, that we become a living human being, vivified by the Spirit. So that just as Adam was a type of the one to come, so also the breath that animated Adam at the beginning is but a sketch of the life that we're called to live in Christ. And this is, moreover, a process in which he says the hands of God are continually working, forming us to be in the statue of Christ. Or as the next sentence on the quotation sheet puts it, from the letter of Barnabas, and this, I think, is the best definition I've ever come across of a human being. The human being is earth that suffers. Anthropos guy, ye est in pascasa. The human being is earth that suffers. The hands of God molding the human being. Suffering as we are molded by the hands of God, as clay in the hands of the potter, into his image, a process that continues throughout our lives, culminating in our death, resurrection, at which point we can finally say we are created. Finally made into that which, is God, which God has planned from the beginning. And that again is scriptural language. Look at the next quotation from Psalm 103, 104. It says, when you take away their breath, they die return to the dust. When you send forth your spirit, they will be created as future. They will be created. You renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Creation is eschatological, not protological. Now, the decisive step in this direction from Adam to Christ occurs when we voluntarily embrace the cross and our own death in Christ, which in Christian terms is played out in the sacrament of baptism. But it's important to note how the apostle changes the tense when he speaks about baptism. He changes the tense from the past tense to the future tense. In Romans 6, he says, if we have been united with him in a death like him, past tense, we shall be, future tense, um, united with him in a resurrection like, him, like his. Our sacramental death in baptism is once for all and in the past, but his point is that until we are actually dead in the ground as clay, the resurrection lies in the future. And so he concludes, therefore, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You can put it this way. You can say, until that point, we are stuck in the first person singular. We're only able to say to myself, didn't I die well to myself today? It's still me who's doing it. With all the inevitable paradoxes that flow from that ambiguity. But when, on the other hand, I am actually dead, placed in the ground to become earth, then I stop working and God can finally create. Yeah? Earth is our end, not our beginning, but an end which becomes our beginning. So by following this line of thinking, Ignatius, Irenaeus, and then the writers who follow them in their footsteps, we can see our, and they don't use the language, but our fall, into apostasy, into sin, into death, as being inscribed 
within the single economy of God, starting from Christ and culminating in Christ, the Alpha and the Omega of all things. The whole economy from the beginning to the end turns upon and is shaped by him and his passion. Because it's only in the light of the cross that scripture is opened up so we can see how from the beginning to the end it speaks about him. That we can read the narrative of the ark that leads from Adam to Christ. And as that's so, we can see that his death destroys death, not by obliterating it, but by turning it inside out. Or as Maximus puts it, Christ changes the use of death. So that instead of being the end, it in fact becomes the beginning. Now to put that, all of that in other language, well, other words, slightly different words, we could say that we come into existence in Adam. We come into existence animated by a breath of life. A breath which is inherently transient. That's what a breath is. A breath expires. But from the beginning of our existence, we do all that we can to hold on to that breath. But no matter how well we live, or whatever we do, the breath will expire. As Irenaeus puts it, in times long past, it was only said that Adam was in the image of Christ, but it was not shown. And because it was not shown, because we don't see it from the beginning, we easily lose that status. But now Christ, the image, has shown us the life of God and not and didn't do so simply by destroying death, after all, we still die, but rather by destroying him who has, who has the, um, the power of death, so that he might deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage, as Hebrews puts it. It's the fear of death that drives us to try to hold on to our breath, our breath of life. It's a fear of death that gives rise to all the other passions that flow from this egoism, ensnaring ourselves in all those different aspects of our mortality. If we try to preserve our life, as Christ points out, as the basic law of life, if we try and preserve our life, we'll lose it. No matter how hard we hold on to our breath, it will expire. But, he continues, if we lose it, for his sake, the neighbor, the gospel, the kingdom, we gain it. We will begin to live a life which cannot be touched by death because we've entered into it through death. Going to Irenaeus, the breath and the spirit cannot coexist. And this is not because one is some kind of natural life and needs to be removed before we acquire a supernatural life. It is rather because when the breath is used in a Christ-like manner, by dying to itself, it opens up to the spirit. Behold, dying we live. So, to put it again in slightly different language, we come into existence in Adam, thrown into the world with no choice about the matter. As Kirillov in Dostoevsky's The Possessed puts it, nobody asked me if I wanted to be born. We come into existence, moreover, animated by a breath of life, which is inherently transient and finite, which will expire. Basically, we're as good as dead from the beginning. Necessity and mortality characterize our existence in Adam. Motivated by the fear of death, we try to hold on to the breath entrenching ourselves ever more firmly in the mortality and the passions that, give rise, that it gives rise to. But if, rather, in faith and love, we are ready to use our breath to lose our lives in a Christ-like manner for the kingdom, for the neighbor, for the gospel, and so on, then we are born into life, a life which cannot be touched by death because we've entered into that life through death. We already begin, even now, 
to, leave, to live the immortal life of the Spirit. And in this way, we are born into life as a human being, as Christ has shown that human being to be. So, in Maximus's words, as Christ has changed the use of death, we are able to change the ground of our existence from necessity and mortality, which is how we've come into this world, to change it from necessity and mortality to freedom and self-sacrificial love, which is the very uncreated being and life of God himself. So rather than seeing us as already and always already human, and having um, and always as having been so, we are fundamentally human from the beginning. And if you're a Christian, you may say, well, we need to be redeemed from the apostasy into which we've fallen. What we see in these early figures, like Irenaeus and Ignatius, and it continues thereafter, is seeing thing, all things in the light of Christ, such that there is one single economy which is both creative and salvific, leading us from the sketch to the reality, from the breath to the spirit, from Adam to Christ, and doing so by sharing in the death of Christ to finally become a living human being at the end. And that's the living human being that Irenaeus says is the glory of God. The living human being is the glory of God, and he means the matter. So, I've spent a lot of time talking on that, I've written much about all of that. Now what I'm reflecting on further in the light of that is that if this is so, if we are yet to become human, what are the implications of this for understanding ourselves as male and female? Because it's striking that if God's project is to create a human being, in his image and likeness, and we see that's eschatological, what he in fact does is make males and females. Yeah? So if you look at the next quotation on your sheet, uh, well, the, so the, the one after, Genesis 1, 27, 28. So God created the human being's own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Okay, we all know that verse. But there's more to it, I think, than we initially think. In terms of the poem of the first chapter of Genesis, two things here are left unexplained. If you just simply read from Genesis 1 onwards, there are two things here which are not explained. Firstly, what is it to be in the image? And secondly, what is it to be male and female? Now, we tend to link the word male and female to the blessing to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and so on. Yet this same blessing is bestowed upon the other animals in Genesis 1.22, but they are not said to be male or female. Only in Genesis 6.19 do they finally say, with Noah's Ark, do they actually call them male and female. Okay? Just in terms of Genesis 1, they're not said to be male or female. So maybe there's more in being male and female than simply being able to be fruitful and multiply. Regarding the term image, it's often said that the purpose of Genesis 1, 26, uh, 27, 28 is to, as it were, democratize the, the status of being in the image. Something that in the ancient Near East was a prerogative of the king, so now it belongs to all human beings to have dominion over the earth. But again, that's not actually said in a scriptural text, either here or elsewhere. Reading the text in the light of Christ, as we've done above, we may well make a distinction between the image, who is Christ, Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, and human beings who are made in the image. Okay? And that's a fairly standard way of reading the text from the beginning. But there's also another way of doing it, and that is to note that in the second and third verses of Genesis 1.27, second and third uh, clauses, image and male and female are placed in parallel. So God created a human being in the image, created him, male and female, he created them. 
So is there something then between the parallel between those two clauses? Now, I do not mean to suggest at all that there's anything in God corresponding to male and female. Rather, what I would do is to suggest that if God's project is to make a human being in his image, and as we've seen above, uh, as, we, as we saw the fullness of that above, the, the human being being one who lays down their life in love for another, and his way of setting about this project is to make males and females, then I think one can argue that our existence as sex and sexual beings turns out to be the horizon on which we learn to become human. It's important to note that when the apostle asserts that Christ is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15, it's specifically in the context of hymning the, the one who makes peace by the blood of his cross. It's a, it's a him on the crucifixion. It is, as we saw above, in laying down his life that Christ shows us what it is to be God and what it is to be human. So our existence as males and females is in fact the horizon, at least for a large number of people, we can get further, I might get further things later on. It's a horizon on which we learn through the power of erotic attraction to lay down our lives for another. Through the erotic drive, deeply implanted in us by God, we are drawn out of ourselves to die to ourselves and live our lives in virtue of another. So as Dionysius put it in the quotation just above the one from Genesis 1, 26, 27, the divine eros brings ecstasy so that the lover belongs not to self but to the beloved. This existence of males and females is the horizon in which, quite literally, we become humanized. A similar point can be made about Genesis 2. After creating Adam from the dust of the earth, animating him by a breath of life, placing him in the garden to work, God then observes, it's not good for man to be alone. There's, that's a quotation there, Genesis 2.18. Ukalon ine anthropon monon. And we're going to come back to that later in a very different way of reading it. We, we, we typically translate, it's not good for man to be alone. And so God determines to make a helper fit and meet for him, equal to him. But think about it, what does God then do? Before he actually makes Eve, he actually introduces all the animals to Adam. He leaves all the animals to Adam. By the time you get to verse 20 of chapter 2, it said that, but for the man there was not found a helper fit for him. It's expressed in the passive, but for the man there was not found a helper. Well, who found that? It's not really clear from the, from the verse itself. So there are only two possibilities, God or Adam. Now, if it's God, then you have to ask, why did he introduce all the animals to Adam? It's not good for, an animal, for, for man to be alone. Is he really working by trial and error? You know, here, try a giraffe. No, it doesn't work. Here, try a butterfly. No, it doesn't work. No. Almost certainly it's not meant to be that way. It's not God working by trial and error. It's much, much more likely Adam. After all, after Adam is put to sleep and the rib taken from his side, built into a woman and led to the man, Adam then exclaims, here at last is bone of my bone. So in verse 18, it's God who realizes it's not good for man to be alone. But Adam needs to come to this realization. And it's by bringing all the animals to Adam that God awakens this realization, that God instructs him. It's pedagogy. So Adam then finally says, where's mine? Yeah? And then finally gets his. Now, given the preponderance of um, monastics, among those counted saints by the church, the Christian tradition much more generally, it's not surprising there's been a great tendency to think that sanctification consists in approximating the monastic life, 
whether literally, if you want to be holy, you've got to join the, the monastic life, or spiritually. You get people in the 20th century, people like Edward Kimo, talking about interiorized monasticism. It's sometimes claimed that from the 4th century onwards, monasticism replaced martyrdom, the martyrdom of the early centuries, as the form of sanctity known by the church. But this really needs to be restated. It was by understanding itself as martyrdom that monasticism continued the path of holiness. St. Anthony is depicted by Athanasius as being a martyr, martyring himself in the desert. He's fighting with wild beasts in the desert, just like the Christians in the arena were fighting with the wild beasts. It's martyrdom that is a paradigmatic form of holiness. The top quotation sheet from Isaiah really points it out. Be my witnesses, martyrs, I too am a witness, says the Lord God and a servant whom I've chosen. It's martyrdom that's a form of witness, uh, that's a form of holiness. This martyrdom continues within monasticism, but also within marriage. Marriage is a form of martyrdom. And by that, I don't just mean how long do I have to put up with her, but rather in, in marriage, you learn to live not for yourself, but for another. The, the cross is one and the same for all. Married, monastic, single, whatever, one and the same for all. It should also be noted, and this is an important point, it's kind of off topic, but it'll be an important point for a couple of the texts I want to look at in a minute. It's also important to note that um, although a blessing and an increased opportunity for martyrdom, children are not the goal of marriage, as is often said. It's noteworthy that when Christ reaffirms in Matthew 19, what, when he reaffirms that what is from the beginning, that we are created male and female to become one flesh, nothing is said about procreation. Similarly, when the apostle affirms that because of the temptation to pornea, because we are created as sexual beings, each man should have a wife, each wife a, a woman a husband, their bodies are not their own, but each other's, that they should give themselves to each other. Again, nothing is said about procreation. Only really with uh, Clement of Alexandria do you start getting procreation as being the defining goal of marriage, and then it's reaffirmed by Augustine and becomes part of the tradition more generally. Okay. But it's not there within scripture. So marriage, I would argue, is not primarily at least, or uh, at least about or defined by procreation, legitimizing sexual activity or providing a safe space for its exercise. Neither is marriage about preserving traditional values. It's not about the self-preservation of the nuclear family. It subverts and sublimates these. It provides a horizon for achieving the fullness of the stature of being human that Christ has shown by the way of the cross. Sexuality embodies this erotic drive towards transcendence, transforming those who love with the martyric love shown by Christ into another state, neither male nor female, but human. So let's look at a couple of texts um, from St. Maximus especially. There are a couple of really key texts, one by Gregory of Nyssa on the making of man, which is too long for us to do today, and then the other one is Maximus' is Ambiguum 41. And they talk about this relationship between being male and female and being human in really, really intriguing ways. But I think they've always been misinterpreted because they've always, they, they haven't yet, the interpretations have not yet worked with the understanding of becoming human as the eschatological goal rather than a protological beginning. So Maximus, Ambiguum 41. It's one of the most quoted, most referred to texts of, Ma of Maximus, but very rarely discussed in any detail, despite the fact it's only five pages long. He presents a full cosmological vision based upon the reconciling work of Christ in which there are five fundamental divisions or differences in creation that the human being is given the vocation of uniting and bringing into union with God. 
and that while we've not been able to do that, Christ does it and enables us in him or him in us to do so. The five divisions, he says, within, uh, within all of reality are firstly between the uncreated and the created, secondly between the intelligible world and the sensible world, third between heaven and earth, fourth between paradise and the inhabited world, so it's kind of a, a, a branch tree that he's describing here. And then fifth is a human being. So the first quotation from Maximus, A, uh, at the bottom of page one, he says, the fifth is that according to which the human being, if you see three lines down, I've got a, a, a dash after human being and then a dash after Genesis. Those three lines are all between the article o, the, an anthropos. Yeah, he's got really, really bad Greek. Okay? It's really dense and all, all over the place. Um, so you have to read it, you know, the, the fifth is that according to which the dot, 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 human being is divided, but you can't do that in English. According to which the human being, who is above all like a most capacious workshop, containing all things and naturally mediating through itself all the divided extremities, having been placed beneficially amidst beings according to Genesis, is divided into male and female. Manifestly possessing by nature the full potential to draw all the extremities into union through their means by virtue of its characteristic attribute of being related to the divided extremities through their own parts. The mode according to which cause of the genesis of the divided beings being fulfilled through this potentiality, the human being will come to, be, come to establish clearly through itself the great mystery of the divine purpose. It's, it's very wordy. What he's saying is that the human being contains all his divisions within itself, and by reconciling, uniting them all, we come to bring everything into union, then everything into union with God. And so it's shown in us the fulfillment of the great mystery of the divine purpose, which is the union with each other, the extremities and beings, proceeding harmoniously from what is clear to what is far off, and successively in order from what is inferior to what is superior, culminating in union with God. Okay. So after introducing these five divisions, he then speaks about how we are to unite them. So the top of page two. We're to unite these five divisions by starting with the division which is closest to us and then working successively through all further divisions. So we're to start with um, the male and female. So he carries on. This is why the human being was introduced last among beings. Like a kind of natural bond mediating between the extremities through its parts and unifying through itself those the things that are by nature separate from each other by a great distance. So that, by making of its own division a beginning of the unity which gathers up all things to God their author, and proceeding by order and rank through, their mean, through the mean terms, it might reach the limit of their sublime ascent which comes about through union of all things in God in whom there's no division. And we're to do this, first of all, by completely shaking off from nature by means of a supremely dispassionate condition of virtue, the property of male and female, which in no way depends, according to the original principle, could be the original principle, or it could be the foregoing account that I've just given, which is related to Genesis. So the distinction between male and female, which in no way depends upon the divine purpose concerning the genesis of the human being. Now, everyone's translated that as being, so Andrew Louth and Nick Constance translated it as human generation, which makes sense like how humans are going to replicate, m multiply, procreate. But no, it's simply the genesis of the human being, the divine purpose concerning the genesis of the human being. Um, so we're to shake off the property of male and female by virtue so that the divine purpose concerning the genesis of the human being can be seen so that it might be shown to be and becomes anthropon monon, simply a human being, according to the divine purpose, not divided by the designation of male and female according to which principle or account it formerly came into being, nor divided into the parts that now appear around it, thanks to the perfect knowledge or the perfect union, as I said, of or with its own principle according to which it exists. So by virtue, by virtue, by supreme condition of divine virtue, we overcome this distinction between male and female. We shake it off from nature through virtue 
so the divine purpose concerning the genesis of the human being can be shown, and we might be shown to be and become simply a human being. Now, the words are anthrop anthropomonon, and I've not been able to figure out, is Maximus playing upon Genesis 2? Where in Genesis 2, the only thing which is said not to be good is anthropomonon. It's not good for man to be alone, or it's not good to be only a human being. Could be either. Okay. Um, he goes on to describe how human beings have failed to do this, and then he turns to how Christ reconciles all these things. So, C from Maximus. To be sure, initiating the universal union of all things in himself, beginning with our own division, he became the perfect human being, having be assumed from us, for us, and consistent with us everything that is ours, lacking nothing but without sin. For to become human, he had no need of the natural process of marital intercourse, showing in this way, I think, that there was perhaps another mode foreknown by God for the growth to a multitude of human beings. And again, both Louth and Constance translate it as, as um, another way for human beings to increase, another way for the multiplication of human beings, which I think misses the mark. It's another, it's another mode perhaps could have been foreknown by God for the growth to a multitude of human beings. Had the first human being kept the commandment and not cast itself down to the level of rational animals by misusing the mode of its proper powers. So he drove out from nature the difference and division into male and female, which was in no way needed for the coming to be of the human being. Um, again, they translate it differently. And without which it could have existence, without the existence of which it could perhaps have been possible. But there's no need for this division to last perpetually, for in Christ Jesus, the apostle says, there's neither male nor female. So I think Maximus is not suggesting here, he's not suggesting that before the fall, which he doesn't even speak about, there was another way in which human beings could have reproduced otherwise than as male and female procreation. The contrast is not between male and female procreation and another way of procreation, as is usually depicted. The contrast is between male and female procreation which results in more males and females, um, that contrast and the, the becoming a human being in the full sense, the genesis of the human being in the full sense that we've explored it earlier on today. Procreation through male and female was not needed for Christ to become human, but neither is it through male and female procreation as male and female that we become human. We become human by learning virtue and by seeing each other as human rather than male or female. Sexual reproduction is not problematic because of its impassioned embrace of husband and wife, about which Max has got nothing negative to say at all, but because the one begotten that way, the one that Maximus focuses on, comes into existence involuntarily, passively, with no choice in contrast to the voluntary birth into life by actively taking up the cross. Maximus does indeed suggest that there perhaps was another way that God could have brought the human being to come into existence. All things are possible to God. But it's hard, if not impossible, to see how that could be so. Because to come to be a human being is to voluntarily lay down your life for another. And in fact, it is through male and female and learning virtue this way that God has chosen to set about his project of making human beings. Okay, the final quotation in which Maximus does this uh, is a little bit later on in the work where he's talked about the work that Christ has done and then turns to how Christ works this in us. Okay, so this is D. Finally, after all of these things, he, considered according to the concept of his humanity, comes to God himself, appearing as a human as it's written before the face of God the Father on our behalf, he who has word can never in any way be separated from the Father, fulfilling as human in deed and truth with perfect obedience all that he himself as God has preordained should take place, having completed the whole plan of God the Father for us. We who through our misuse had rendered ineffective the power that was given to us from the beginning by nature for this purpose. So he first united, first of all, he united ourselves in himself 
through the removal of the difference between male and female. And instead of men and women, in whom this mode of division is especially contemplated, he showed us properly and truly to be anthropon monon, simply a human being, thoroughly formed according to him, bearing his image intact and completely unadulterated, touched in no way by any marks of corruption. It's the first time he mentions men and women. Every other time it's been male and female. This contrast and it's the, division between, the distinction between men and women is where we especially see the contrast between male and female. The two are not equivalent for him, but that's a, a different topic. So in Maximus, we've got this long reflection about how we actually become human. And we become human by virtue through the, overcoming the distinction between male and female and then reconciling all the other divisions within ourselves, leading the whole of creation into union with God. It's not that we stop being male and female, but rather we see each other as human. One could really say that to the extent that we identify ourselves by our sexuality, whether male or female or anywhere in between, we are doing so in Adam, not in Christ. We're not human, we're merely in Adam. So to wrap up, what it is to be human and the place and role of existence as male and female within this and indeed, really, the question of death are the burning issues of our epoch. Although it's not framed in the language of modern science, the kind of theological reflection I've been exploring in this paper can still speak to us when we hear it not as a report of things that happened way back in the mythological past and which are not accepted by science anyway, nor if we take them as being scientific statements about biology or something like that but rather when, when we take them as opening up to us the scriptural framework of God's own purpose to make living human beings in his image. And this is a project in which we are very much involved as the ones who have to say, let it be. It indeed does have a lot to offer us. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you.